so i welcome you uh, to the third lecture of the course title psychology of emotion theory and applications so this is the third lecture of module 1 and overall also it is the third lecture so the today's lecture will, is titled as communication and measurement of emotion so we'll talk about how emotion serves as a communicative purpose what are the how emotions are communicated uh, in that context and also we'll talk about uh, measurement of emotions how emotion can be measured particularly in the field of psychology and other associated disciplines so before we talk about today's lecture let me give you a brief recap of lecture 2 that is the last lecture so in the last lecture we talked about we gave a historical background uh, and uh, some basic theories of emotions uh, in that context we discussed some of the prominent figures in the research of emotions and um, some of the theories that evolved out of the, their research so we discussed charles darwin's concept of emotion how darwin talked talked about emotions and we have discussed in detail about some of the major ideas of darwin primarily we have seen that darwin talked about that emotion emotional expression actually evolved it either directly from adapted behavior or association with the adaptive behavior so it's a it's an it's, it says an evolutionary purpose adaptive purpose uh, of all the emotional expression because it helps us to survive uh, darwin also gave lot of many ideas which we have discussed and uh, one of the main thing that he also talked about is the the concept of basic universal emotions and uh, the methodology that he used uh, by showing photograph and taking observers you know leveling of emotions he still used one of the major methods so he has contributed a lot, lot in terms of theories as well as methodology of emotional research and then we talked about the contribution of william james uh, who gave a particular theory along with another person called lenje which is called the james lenje theory that talks about uh, the idea of James theory was that you know physiological arousal precedes emotional experience. So, whenever an event happens first physiological arousal happens and then emotional experiences happens by kind of leveling it leveling those emotional physiological arousal which is kind of counterintuitive. They gave some evidence but obviously this uh, his this theory had lot of uh, limitations. Uh, particularly lot of limitation limitation indicated by canon walter cannon who is an american physiologist he also gave a theory uh, which along with another person uh, so that theory is called as canon bar theory uh, canon bar theory talks about that if whenever we uh, an, an event happens in the environment so three things happen simultaneously and independently so physiological arousal experience of the emotion and uh, so whatever and 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 the, and, the, and the cognition part of it cognitive cognitive leveling whatever happens cognitions feelings as well as uh, you know physiological arousals all these three things happens simultaneously and independently no one is causing the other then we talked about schechter singer theory that also is one of the first co cognitive theories where you no know, interpretation cognitive interpretation was giving lot of importance uh, this theory talks that emotional uh, experience depends on cognitive processing and leveling of physiological arousal by looking at the surrounding. So, so there is an interaction between physiological arousal and cognitive processing and leveling. So, whenever uh, an event happens, so there is an cognitive leveling, physiological arousal, and which emotion will be experienced, it depends on the interpretation of the situation in you are in. So, the same physiological arousal can lead to happy experience if the situation triggers happiness or it may lead to whatever unhappy or sadness or whatever it is depending on the situation. Uh, similarly, appraisal theories also evolved uh, which are pure cognitive theories which gives primary focus on cognitive appraisal or interpretation is the first thing that happens then it triggers physiological arousal and the emotional experience. So, the primacy of uh, cognitive processing is given a lot of importance in the appraisal theories, primary the theories uh, you know included like you know Re Richard Lazarus and so on. Zezong Ledox theory also we talked about where we discussed that, uh, that they said that some emotional experience could bypass cognitive interpretation. For example, you know whenever a loud sound happens unexpectedly we experience 
immediate emotion. So, the, there is no cognitive intervention here. You do not think should I be fear, fearful or not. So, in some emotional cases, uh, such bypass can happen. So, that was uh, their idea. So, some of these theories we talked about and we also kind of looked at pros and cons, limitations of each of these theories in the last class. So, today we will talk about communication of emotion. Uh, in that, in this we will talk about uh, particularly the non-verbal communication of emotion which is very interesting and significant that we communicate emotion in so many ways other than the language uh, like you know facial expressions, bodily expression, exp uh, no, expression of emotion through voice and so on. So, we will look into all these aspects today. Then also we will uh, we'll talk about measurement of emotion, how emotions are measured in the research, um, particularly through self report measures, physiological measures and behavioral measures. So, these will be some of the key uh, points through which we will uh, navigate in today's lecture. So, communication of emotion uh, is one of the central aspect of human social life. Uh, we experience emotions, diverse emotion throughout the day in every day on a daily basis and this emotion when we experience it, it most of the time it is, it, it is not just your own thing, it kind of happens in the context of relationship with other people in the environment and uh, there is this sense of communicative purpose to it. So, it communicates lot of things about us, what is our intention, what is our state of mind and so on. So, emotion has a very strong communication purpose, it communicates a lot of things about us uh, and we express emotion which is communicated to other person, other person knows how we are feeling because communication is expressed through so many channels including face, including voice, body movements, postures and so on. So, when we talk about communication of emo emotion, so there can be uh, two ways to look at it. So, communication of emotion can be done by majorly two channels. So, one is verbal communication and one is non-verbal communication. So, in the verbal communication, So, basically using language, non-verbal communication includes all kinds of paralinguistic So, emotion can be communicated I majorly by through basically verbal communication or non-verbal communication. So, in verbal communication it is very simple, uh, we express emotion by saying something, by saying the words. For example, I am feeling angry or I am feeling sad, I am feeling happy. So, this is directly communicating through language, expressing using words of a particular language, whatever language one is speaking. So, it is a straightforward thing. So, verbal communication of uh, emotion can happen when we express it using our language or some phrases whatever it is you know is available in that particular language. Uh, the interesting part is non-verbal communication. So, so words are not just you know uh, the major uh, way that we express emotions. So, many other channels of non-verbal communication of emotion happens which is very interesting in that sense which are not linguistic just based on uh, you know. So, it it may include facial expression. So, you without saying through face one can ex understand what kind of emotion one is experiencing through body movements. So, all these things can you know kind of you know gestures, body movements and so on uh, 
uh, voice also how you speak the same language same sentences can mean so many things depending on how you say it so voice also communicates your intention how you, what you want to communicate it also communicates so a large chunk of communication of emotion actually depends on non verbal channels and paralinguistic channels uh, so we'll talk uh, mostly about non verbal part of it because we a lot of research has gone into it linguistic uh, verbal communication anyway we know it's all through language so non verbal communication of emotion is something that we'll focus on here uh, so each emotional expression can connote diverse meanings and refers to many classes of non verbal behavior so so non verbal understanding of emotion is very important because a lot of complexities and nuances of communication can happen through non verbal communication of emotion for example a smile may mean many things you know if a person is smiling it may mean lot of thing depending on you know, the non verbal you know communicational channel that are there in in the context so a smile may mean politeness or a smile can also hide feelings of disapproval you know so when you have a feeling of disapproval you can just smile just to hide that or to express romantic att attraction to or it can signal certain weaknesses also sometimes smile is smile smiling can also signal sense of weakness uh, to pretend that we are following what another person is saying and so on so one even same the uh, non verbal aspect of behavior can mean lot of things depending on the context so one expression may mean many things depending on the non verbal non verbal aspects of it you know depending on how it is expressed the different non verbal channels associated with it may mean lot of things so that is why it's important to understand the non verbal aspects of emotions now before we talk about uh, specific non verbal communication of emotion let us see uh, the different categories of non verbal behavior so paul ekman as we have already discussed about his theories uh, in detail he is one of the pioneer in the field of emotional research uh, and wallace freisen uh, they organize non verbal behavior into five categories so all the non verbal behaviors can be categorized under five categories one is called as emblems so in every non verbal communication there can be emblems what is emblems basically means uh, it basically means uh, gestures that directly translate to words so this is these are the gestures that we use while talking and communicating uh, but these gestures can be translated into specific meaningful words uh, so they are intentional gestures that we do these are not like unintentionally happens we intentionally indicate something through these gestures uh, which can be easily translated into words okay so sometimes <coughs> so so a lot of such emblems we use for example we use thumbs up which basically means okay or something you are saying it's fine fine go ahead so even if you don't say anything just show thumbs up it will it 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 will communicate the person understand it means okay you know so it can be easily translated into a meaningful word okay or you just indicate come here even if you don't say you just show this some person will understand he is saying come here okay so these are called emblems so they are intentional gestures that we use which can be easily translated into words they need not be associated with some sentences or words or something sometimes just indication can one can, other can decode it uh, into a specific meaningful words okay uh, only thing is that lot of these emblems can mean different thing in different cultures so maybe in one culture thumbs up is a good thing or indicates okay or something in other culture people may not take it in a positive light or something like that so from culture to culture this emblems may uh, change meaning you know so they may not have a fixed meaning across all cultures so the, these these are called emblems so these are non verbal part of certain communication which indicates you know uh, also communicates lot of things second is called illustrators uh, illustrators are little bit different from emblems in a sense that you know these are also gestures just like emblems uh, but they gend they are accompanied and accompanied with speech so in emblems are not necessarily accompanied with the speech 
but illustrations are always associated with speech. So, you say something and with your sentences you show certain gestures. So, accompanied with the speech uh, to make it clear visuals and emphatic to emphasize something you are saying something as well as you are indicating something just to add emphasis to it. So, those are called illustrators. Uh, so, they are just gestures used to illustrate uh, certain verbal message to enhance the understanding of the receiver or whoever is uh, listening. So, whenever we uh, give direction to someone generally we say you go straight and then turn right. So, this is an illustrator. So, you are say, speaking as well as indicating with gestures. Without speaking probably this will not mean, mean much, person may not understand. So, you are saying go straight and then turn right. So, you are saying as well as indicating something just to add emphasis to it or to make the meaning more clear. So, these are called illustrators. Uh, then comes regulators. Uh, regulators are non-verbal again uh, certain behaviors that we do. Uh, or use to coordinate or regulate conversation. So, conversations to regulate conversation or to kind of according to our uh, situation. Uh, so, it includes behavior such as nodding heads, eyebrow flashes. So, you when we make conversation with people along with whatever we speak, we also nod head, no, we just say ki yes, no, something like that to regulate it just to make it you know more smooth or something like that. We also use eyebrows flashing you know so which also communicate something or sometimes use lips also the movement of lips and so on. So, these are all called regulators which are kind of you know the subtle way kind of the non verbal behaviors which regulates or uh, you know conversations or uh, uh, communication of information. The fourth one is called as self adapters. Self adapters are basically mostly the nervous activities that appear in with which we, which have no apparent goal other than to release nervous energy. So, many time in conversation in communication uh, the people uh, release their nervous energy by like scratching their chins or you know scratching their head or something like this, uh, biting their lips something like this. So, a lot of these are actually channels through which some nervous energy are you know released they also communicate something. So, these are also part of non verbal communication. Uh, so, most of the time they are unconsciously happens you may not be very consciously doing them you know. So, these are called self adapters. The fifth one is display of emotion in terms of non verbal aspect. So, this is where we will talk uh, in the remaining part of our lecture. So, in the display of emotion when we specifically display your emotion it includes facial expression, it includes uh, your voice, it includes the body movement etcetera. So, these are some of the things through which we communicate emotions, communicate information through all these channels, non-verbal channels uh, apart from linguistic aspects. So, the facial expression is the most important thing you know, our emotions are my, like you know most vividly shown in our face face is the mirror of our inner expressions. So, uh, one of the most crucial part of human communication is facial expression. Uh, face is in charge of conveying not only thoughts or ideas, but emotion. No? We all know whenever we talk to somebody, we see look at their face only. So, everything is communicated through face. So, expression of face says everything you know. So, so, <clears throat> so this plays central part in terms of communication of info communication of emotions particularly and other things also facial expression can convey and emotion is one aspect to it. The so, facies are uh, possibly the most essential and eye catching objects that people see and is the first thing babies also perceive after birth. Now, we are subse vivid uh, we whenever we communicate with someone we look at their face only. So, this is the first thing even a child when after birth of the child a baby only looks at the face kind of all the communication happens through face of the mother and the other people okay. um, until a newborn develops language comprehensions uh, her caregivers non verbal behavior becomes the channel of communication because child cannot understand the language initially. So, all the communication happens through non verbal communication and most 
importantly through facial expression. Face and facial expression continues to be important even after we learn to communicate. So, baby once learn the communication also with language also again the importance of the face never fades away it still remains very important. Uh, face attracts our attention more than the other visual stimuli and when we quickly notice it. So, this is the first thing we notice it. So, it is adaptive for human to pay attention to faces. It was an adaptive because it is necessary to survive to understand other person we immediately we focus on their faces. So, it is adaptive in that sense <coughs> since others around us facial expression reveal information about their emotion as well as their attitude towards us and the objects in our surroundings. So, we understand about the person's intention, person's uh, whether the person is willing to talk to me or associated with me all these things we get cues from their facial expression. This knowledge then influences our own behavior. So, according to their expression we then more, you know, regulate our own behavior. So, for example, nowadays if you see in the uh, in the era of social uh, networking or social media and so on, there is a growing usage of emojis in the uh, in the whatever textual message in WhatsApp or messages everywhere emojis are very popular nowadays. So, why emojis are used even though you can write about whatever you are feeling uh, people sometimes just use emojis to express something. So, emoji is nothing it is just a face with certain emotional expressions sad face, happy face, angry face and so on. So, we, you uh, so without writing few sentences even just one emoji can express more than writing many sentences you know because it is just a face that expresses everything you know. So, that is why these emojis are very popular you know they express your emotion much better way and also it helps to give more meaningful clarity to your sentences. So, you add emojis to your textual messages. So, it kind of you know uh, makes your communication much better especially communicates your emotion to the other person. The mechanics of facial expression you know how facial expression happens and lot of things you know. So, we do not go too much into it, but little bit of just understanding how complex mechanisms are there in the facial expression you know. It happens very automatically to us, but actually so much of mechanics are involved in it. So, facial expressions are created by the coordinated contraction of muscle groups. There are so many muscles groups in our face and coordinated contraction happens depending on different expression that we do, which results in faults and wrinkles on the face of the uh, on the skin of the face. Other skeletal muscles in the body on the other hand are connected to bone and can move your skeleton. So, facial muscles are little bit different different from other uh, other muscles. It is estimated that about 43 muscles groups are involved in the facial expression. So, you just a small face and 43 separate muscle groups are there which can coordinately move and express so many emotions. This muscle is also control, control the sensory organs of the face such as closing and opening of the eyes. So, they do not just are about emotions, they also do lot of uh, sensory functions like opening and closing of eyes, mouth and so on. Uh, by changing those muscles, we can express lot of emotions. So, uh, the way you our brain receives feedback from the facial muscles. So, brain whenever there is a movement in the facial muscles signal is signal goes to the brain and brain accordingly you know kind of you know uh, helps us to experience certain emotions. <coughs> so, your facial muscles about their current state is also distinct because it relies on something called as mechanoreceptors in the skin. So, this is called mechanoreceptors in the facial muscles uh, which are mostly sensitive to changes in the position. So, whenever there is a change in the position of the muscles in the face. So, they have mechanoreceptors which send signals to the brain and brain interprets according to whatever situation. So, the facial muscles have mechanoreceptors as compared to that other muscles have proprioceptors. proprioceptors uh, in other muscles uh, which are basically provide constant information about the stretching and contraction. For example, legs may stretching contraction yoga to you understand and thus is signal signal goes to the brain and so on. So, there is a uh, in terms of mechanics of it there is a difference in terms of receptors 
facial muscles has mechanoreceptors, other muscles have proprioceptors. So, in that sense, uh, a little bit of different, they are different, facial muscles are different in terms of feedbacks, particularly they depend on the, if there is a change in the position of the facial muscles, the brain interprets it in certain ways. So, what is fascinating about emotional communication is that it appears as if some of this emo expression of emotions, you know, like fear, anger, disgust, happiness, sadness, surprise are kind of biologically wired across cultures. We have seen some of these theories of basic emotions. Some of these basic emotion have been found across culture and everybody kind of understand even if uh, faces with this emotional expression are shown to those people. Obviously, you know, uh, there are differences may not be all which emotion should should be the basic emotion, there are differences in that. But some of these emotions which are very basic, uh, most of the research shows they are almost like biologically hardwired in our system and uh, they are kind of expressed, these emotions are expressed for example, fear, anger, sadness in a very similar way across all cultures. So, it is kind of shared, seems to be shared uh, across all humanity. So, this debate between universal and culture specific of facial expression we will look into much more detail based on the research later on in the upcoming lectures, but some of this seems to be a you know uh, valid across culture. Now, this uh, faces uh, actually these are uh, this photograph is taken from Paul Ekman groups. I have already shown it while discussing Ekman's theory. So, it just shows the mechanics of face when we experience certain emotions, what kind of muscles specifically changes in the muscle happens. So, you can see I will just show one or two emotions just to give you some idea. So, this uh, you can see when the person has a angry face, some changes happens in the mus facial muscles like here eyebrows are pulled down and together. So, here you know these eyebrows are pulled down and together. So, this becomes uh, much more closer and pulled down, eyes become wide open and one stare height. So, this becomes wide open, lips are pressed tightly and together. So, generally uh, this is one of the typical expression of anger where no, how certain muscles in the faces changes their positions and uh, this leads to the experience of anger or whenever we angry we pose such kind of facial expression. When we face fear similarly you can say how muscles changes in the face, here eyebrows are raised and pulled together. So, these eyebrows are raised here and pulled together, upper eyelid also is raised, um, lower eyelid is tensed, jaw dropped open and lips stretched horizontally backward. So, this is a typical expression of fear and uh, this is how muscles changes when we experience fear. Face of happiness, when we experience joy or happiness, how muscles changes in our face. So, eyes are narrowed and there is a some wrinkling around the eyes. So, these are taken from Paul Ekman's research and uh, from his website these photos are taken. So, these are eyes are generally narrowed and there is some wrinkling here you can see some wrinkles, uh, cheeks are raised you know this part is raised and there is a here wrinkle also, uh, lips are pulled up here pulled back and teeth are and teeth are exposed. So, this is a typical expression of happiness. So, these are some of the examples, uh, uh, Paul Ekman did uh, uh, you know kind of detailed expression how it is done, uh, it happens. Uh, for all these seven basic emotion it is there. One can find it in his website also. So, you can uh, if you are interested you can look at his website and find out the other expressions. So, what what special expression convey? So, there are uh, certain view, different viewpoint about uh, what it expresses, what facial expression actually conveys. So, there are two viewpoints we will talk about here, one is called readouts and another is called behavioral ecology. So, let us see what are these two, two aspects. So, facial expression when innate or learned, whether innate or learned. So, we can learn some expressions are very innate basic emotions like some facial expression we learn through socialization probably. Uh, 
certainly have a communicative function in addition to physiological purpose. So, one is obviously physiologically it helps you to you know automatically you take certain facial expression. Uh, so, apart from that there is a communicative purpose to it. So, there is a debate whether facial expression you know, reveals a person's real internal feelings or reflect the person intention to influence others. So, whether facial expression reveals a re person's real internal feeling, whatever you are actually feeling is it like it comes to your face or you just manipulate it to influence other people or to just show one show whatever you want to show to the other persons. So, based on this, these are the two viewpoints we will talk about it. So, this we will discuss using readout view and behavioral ecology. So, readout view means what? According to this view, uh, there is a close relationship between emotion, close relationship uh, between emotion and expression and this relationship is due to the operation of an inbuilt effect program. So, according to this point, whatever you experience or feel inside is expressed through facial expression. Okay. So, there is a close relationship between whatever emotion you experience and how you express it. So, jo ex whatever you will express, so whatever you will experience, it will be expressed. And this happens because there is an inbuilt biological program within us, emotional program. So, whatever you will feel, it will be expressed. So, jo it emotions are internal, um, you know, external representation of internal feelings. So, according to this B point. So, according to this view, facial expressions mirrors the expressor's inner emotional states. So, it is very straightforward, whatever you feel, it is expressed because of certain biological programming itself. So, in other words, when one experiences an emotion such as fear, facial expression will correctly and honestly reflect that one is terrified. So, whenever you feel fear, it will be expressed in your face, that fear. This facial muscle externalize those internal feelings. So, the function of these facial muscles that we have discussed, their function is to externalize whatever you feel internally, those are externalized through these muscles. So, these mu facial muscles have these functions. You may have uh, learned to conceal or mask some unwanted emotions, people also learn to f they are maybe feeling something and trying to hide it. So, that is possible, one can do that through socialization, but your according to this view, your genuine feeling may leak out your genuine feelings may leak out in the form of subtle facial muscle movement. So, even though you may try to hide it out, but in subtle ways, those emotion will leak out in your face, okay? uh, which may be very evidently may not be visible and so on. So, the idea is because of this inbuilt effect program, it will try to come out through face, even if, if you try to hide it. On the other hand, behavioral ecology point of view says facial expression evolved to indicate expressor social motive in a specific social environment. So, whatever facial expression that we show, these are actually evolved to help us to navigate social world, social motives in a specific social environment. So, social environment to suit social environment, to navigate in the social environment this facial expression evolved. So, they have a kind of social function of, uh, that are served through this face, uh, you know, uh, facial expression. These expressions indicate the expressor intends to do what intends to do and what expressor wants others to do. So, whenever you are communicating, you are you have a certain intention through these emotions and also you want to kind of manipulate others around you. So, this expression can kind of take account of that also, it is not just your inner expression that is just getting out, you are also manipulating your social environment, what others wants, what you want others to do, so that part is also there in the expression. A smile for example, indicates one's wish to connect, so when you smile, it one of the indication is generally that you have a positive attitude and you want to connect to that person, sad expression in general. Uh, indicates a request for aid and comfort. So, it kind of indicating this person is not in a good mood, he wants some comfort or some kind of help from other person. So, it indicates something uh, in a social context, 
it is not just your own personal thing so there is a social environment where you are expressing emotion with the view of your expression as well as you are manipulating what others want you to do you, you want others to do you know so through sadness you are also ex communicating others that you want certain comfort so according to bar, bar behavioral ecology point of view uh, facial expression are frequently expressed in interacting circumstances so if you see we don't make too much of facial expression when you are alone but facial expression becomes much more dominant and prominent when we are interacting with other people so it indicates that it's, it is it has a more of a social function so many studies also indicate that display of facial expressions were more frequent in social context as compared to when you are alone so this behavioral ecology viewpoint also underlies that emotional expression accounts for a small percentage of total repair, repertoire of facial movements produced by human daily. So facial expression can also have many other functions apart from just emotions. People can exp use facial muscles uh, movement for lot of other things like you know to highlight something to reenact something and so on. We all know that you know facial expression not just is for uh, you know to to do lot of other communicative purposes. So the facial expression seems to serve many communicative purposes including communicating information about expressor feelings and about expressor social motives also and behavioral intention. So the idea is both the viewpoints have their own ideas in certain emotions obviously what you uh, know both this viewpoint of behavioral ecology and readout you know, viewpoint is that you know uh, so emotions can have both the purpose in terms of revealing your internal state as well as we also use this emotion to kind of express something in the social situation and also to kind of communicate what others what we want other people to do with us it's a kind of sending signal so another hypothesis or theory you can say which talks about facial expression very specifically is called facial feedback hypothesis um, so a lot of time people in general you know lemon uh, ideas in the context also people uh, may tell you this is a very common advice in most of the cultures that put on a happy face you know face ko khush rakho you know smile karo you smile why people say the idea is a kind of idea is that when you put your face in a particular expression your emotion also changes so when you are sad if you put on your smile it helps you to kind of shift your mood from sadness to some positive emotions so to help you overcome adversities generally people say no put on happy face then you may have understood so this is a common sensical version of this theory this theory basically says you know so it was proposed by this uh, french physician his name is wenbaum israel wenbaum in uh, quite early 1907 he claimed that certain facial expression affect the flow of blood affect the flow of blood to the specific parts of the brain we have already seen no facial muscles are connected to the brain obviously the movement of the facial muscles influences the brain so this theory basically says that facial expression whenever we change the muscles in the face they affect the flow of blood to the specific parts of the brain and uh, this produces specific emotional experience so this changes in the flow of blood changes experiences part of it so brain gets a signal that this is this is a pause of the face that means uh, that that emotion so it will change the emotional experiences by sending its signal to the brain smiling for example may increase blood flow to certain regions of the brain which increases or positive mood so those areas of brain which are responsible for positive mood blood will flow more when we put on smile smiling face or something or like that so that was the idea of this theory and uh, in in many contexts uh, this can be true also that you know sometimes changing your facial expression can change your mood to some extent so that is one of the theory that very specifically talk about how facial expression is related to emotions lot of contemporary theories also kind of uh, accept some of these ideas including izard zezong murphy uh, they claim that making facial expression and getting sensory data from the face modify the intensity or create emotional experiences so it's a kind of modern a uh, lot of theories that also kind of validate some of the claims of the facial feedback theories so put to put it simply according to facial feedback hypothesis uh, facial expression contributes to our emotional st states by a 
feedback from face to the brain so face say uh, it go feedback goes to the brain and brain then changes or create certain emotional experiences uh no facial feedback hypothesis also i mean it receives some support but it is not like everybody has not given equal support not all researchers have found equal support for this theory so there is a positive relation to specific facial expression to specific emotional expression obviously certain facial expression has connection to the positive uh, no corresponding uh, emotional experiences uh a lot of research actually found the effect of facial expression on emotional experience is not very strong it has an influence but the strength or the impact is not that high according to several studies emotional experience is more dependent on the signals from the autonomic nervous system autonomic nervous system that we discussed in the yesterday's or the last class lecture 2 which is responsible for physiological arousal so your heart beat increases your breathing becomes uh, you know rapid and those those physiological increase or uh, arousal actually determines emotions much more strongly than the facial expression facial expression plays an important role but the it is no the impact is not that high it is not the only thing but uh, the feedback from the autonomic nervous system or organs uh, is, is is also very important is much more important than facial feedback or fa muscles uh, feedback from the facial muscles as a result data from uh, facial expression is only one of the several components that contribute so it is one of the component this is not the exclusive factors so uh, this is uh, kind of some important things that we that to uh, that we have discussed about facial expression and we have understood how face can express emotions is very significant now the another part of uh, communication of emotion is through bodily expression of emotions our body movement body postures everything also expresses emotions so there is a systematic and discernible link between emotional state and specific body gestures just like facial expression so there are specific facial expression related to certain emotions similarly it is possible that certain body movements or postures are associated with certain emotions so feedback from the body like feedback from the face can influence intensity of emotional experience for example as the brain gets feedback from the face and accordingly certain emotions are experienced similarly feedback from the overall body can also send signal to the brain and uh, lead to certain experiences of emotions so if there are distinct pattern of body movement related to emotions uh, are there any distinct patterns possible uh, which we can identify and say when you are in a, this state of emotion you will have certain body postures uh, so let us see some of the evidences available so in one study a researcher uh, recorded actors in a darkened room exhibiting certain emotions like disgust fear rage happiness sadness with their body movements okay so this was a study where certain actors in a dark room so where probably face is not much visible through their body they were um, expressing certain emotions most of these basic emotions like fear anger and so on while they were wearing full body costumes with reflective matters at a few key spots in the wrist and heads etc so atkinson and colleagues in 2004 they did this research so it's a dark room Uh, so that the face is not visible so can just body movement communi can communicate certain emotions because face we know from face we can easily understand certain emotions but without looking at face just movement of the body can display certain emotions so to do that they darkened the room when uh, the all these actors who are displaying emotion they wore certain costumes which has a certain light says in certain key parts of their uh, you know part of the body in that particular dress so that these lights will be visible and only more body movement you can see without looking at the face so wearing full body costume with some reflective material some light where light can be visible you know at a few key spots like wrist and head and so on they then asked participant so they were wearing this costumes in the dark mo dark room with certain lights as associated with certain parts of the body so that they can just 
we usually see the body movement how it is happening without looking at the face and the audience certain participants were there uh, looking at that and they were asked to assess the emotion exhibited in the video clips while the performers and entire bodies were visible when only the reflective points on the suits are visible. So, there are two condition one is where entire body was visible. So, there was a videography was shown to the participant videos and another case is only this dark room and with certain reflectors in certain parts of the body uh, where face is not at all visible shown to the participant and ask which emotions they are displaying. You know. So, the, resu uh, the result shows even with the point light displays versions where face is not at all visible, even whole body is not visible, certain key parts of the bodies was visible through the, those light points. Participant shows very good accuracy in identifying the moves according to the emotion. So, a lot of um, uh, participant actually you know, you know they showed very good accuracy in identifying which emotions were displaced by these actors implying that very little information is required to detect an emotion within the body. So, at least this uh, research shows that people can detect emotion through the body movements without even looking at the faces. So, the this was taken from their uh, experiment. So, it was like this in one case the face was masked and the body was visible. The, so, actors were doing movements according to certain emotions. In the second case, the body was even not visible, but certain key points in the body, uh, certain reflectors were there and they were uh, you know, showing those emotion. Uh, and even participant in the those reflector case also could identify some of these typical emotions. So, in that experiment, uh, uh, experiment of Atkinson and their colleagues, you know, uh, how the actor expressed those emotions. So, in case of anger, uh, they kind of the sectors uh, make erratic gestures towards the camera, bahut hi erratic fast movements they were doing, shaking their fists, stumping their feet. So, bahut hi erratic movements kar rahe the. So, this was kind of how the body movement was there in that experiment. Fear was indicated by shrinking, constricting motion away from the camera. So, they were moving away from the camera, shrinking their body as we do in the fear, we do not kind of expand, we kind of constrict in the fear, uh, motions away from the camera frequently with hand raised in protection something like this. You know, so, we will see some of these photographs also. So, the fear was indicated like this, happiness was expressed with broad gestures such as skipping, bouncing up and down and pumping the arms. So, all these movements they were doing to express happiness in that experiment. Sadness was accompanied with uh, sagging posture, self soothing behavior such as placing hands on the face or across the body, uh, certain this, this kind of movement was done. Disgusting emotion was expressed by covering their mouths and noses turned away from the camera and uh, swiped the hands in front of the faces as if waving away a terrible order. Okay. So, this is the kind of movement they did in the experiment and interestingly most of the participant could even identify without looking at face and whole body just reflectors. So, these are some of the uh, you know some other experiments uh, you know some of these photographs were shown if you see when faces are kind of masked how body movement some of the body movement. So, this is obviously a static picture uh, where some of the body posture can express some emotions you know. So, anger could be like this, disgust could be shown like this, fear could be shown some of this movement. Many of us can identify just looking at this face because the here emotions are named here, uh, but even if these emotions are not there lot of this expression of the body posture we can understand you know just looking at that face we can kind of guess what emotion this person is experiencing because face is not visible here. So, this is how happiness is expressed, uh, sadness is expressed like this, surprised and this is these are neutral kind of thing. So, this is a female person, this is a male person, anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, surprise, 
like this. I think we can kind of make sense of it that it at least a lot of these body movements clearly expresses some of these emotions. So, emotions in the voice. Now, body movements we have discussed now, let us see how emotions are expressed in the voice. So, when we speak, when we say something, both the words and the tone of your voice conveys emotions. How you say something? What is the tone of your voice? We all know that, you know. So, this is called linguistically called as, technically called as prosody, which refers to non-linguistic element of your voice. What you say is not focused, but how you say it? What is the rate, pitch and loudness of your utterances? So, that is called the prosody and it can convey a lot of emotions, how you say something. You know? By merely changing the prosodic aspect of speech, one can utilize the same words to portray multiple emotions. You know, Same words, when I say in differently, it can mean so many things, different things depending on the prosodic quality of it. So, if I say something like, you know, uh, what are you doing? Very simple neutral way if I say, what are you doing? So, that is a clear kind of in cues in uh, I am just interested to know what somebody is doing. If I say the same thing with high pitch, what are you doing? So, for example, if I say it like this, so that means one of the aspect could be, you know, I dislike what you are doing. So, I am just with anger, I am saying, what are you doing? You understand? So, the meaning will be completely different in the depending on how I am saying it. So, that is by changing prosodic features, whole meaning and emotions of the sentence could change. So, that is how we express emotion through voice. So, same sentence can become serious, it can become sarcastic, it, beca it can become very exciting, it can become low excited, whatever it is depending on what is the pitch in which you are saying and we all know that. So, vocal expression communicates our feelings to those around us and hence exist to influence others, but they also frequently automatic and uncontrollable. Sometimes as certain emotion happens, automatically our voice changes and it communicates those emotions. So, for example, one may be unable to make voice stop quivering and with nervousness during an important presentation. So, sometimes if you are very nervous when you speak, automatically quivering and shaking happens. It is not that you wanted that, automatically it happens because of those energies and that conveys certain certain thing about certain emotional experiences that you are having, maybe you know you are nervous or something like that, it communicates that. So, much research on verbal expression like that of facial expression has attempted to uncover discrete pattern. So, so lot of research try to understand is there any discrete pre pattern that we can identify for specific emotions in the voice just like as we did for body movements and the facial expression. The investigation of sounds may made by people experiencing various emotions led some researcher to believe that voice reflects only few characteristics of emotions. So, it uh, research shows it may not be possible to understand every aspect of emotions or uh, determine every emotions from the voice, but some aspects of emotions are reflected in the voice, but not may not be very specific emotions. So, specifically physiological arousal whenever happens, it impacts your voice. Whenever you are very aroused, your voice will change in terms of maybe the intensity will become very high. Uh, or it can quiver, whatever it is, you know, certain changes will happen in the voice. So, physiological arousal aspect of the emotion is influenced, uh, uh, is directly influenced on the sound of your voice and some claim that it is the only element which can be detected. So, this is the according to them, not specific emotion we can determine, but that physiological arousal part can be detected in the voice. Other aspects such as valence, positive or negative may be more difficult to understand from the voice itself. Uh, anger and joy, for example, one is positive, one is negative, both are associated with high pitch sound, pitch and loudnessness. So, when you are you are feeling anger or you are feeling joy, voice qualities could be very similar in some, some courses, context. For example, both are associated with similar increase in pitch and loudness, presumably because they are both high arousal emotions. So, pitch and loudness may be very similar in this case, but obviously. Uh, hence, uh, when researchers include full range of acoustic properties. So, when the researchers try to include many other properties of the voice, including irregularities in the speech patterns, whether when somebody is speaking, is there any break in the speech. So, one is obviously the high and low pitch, then there is other aspects of voice like regularities, irregularities in the speech patterns 
changes in the phonation, how those sounds are changed when you speak, as you speak. They found that combination of feature could distinguish emotions in a sentence spoken. So, when we look at all these things, combination of features, uh, then obviously, oh, we, are, we can be more confident in understanding which emotion the person is experiencing. For example, anger may sounds more abrupt. So, obviously, in joy and anger both has high speech, but there may be certain other differences also. When we are angry, our sounds are more abrupt, more abruptly, you know, you suddenly shout at somebody abrupt and then you stop. So, it, it can be more irregular with slight pitch disturbances. When you are very angry, there is there may be pitch disturbances in your speech in speaking and it could be very abrupt and irregular. So, as compared to joy, when we joy, it, is, it may be more regular, but both are high pitch sound, sound may be there associated with both these emotions, but there may be other differences in the qualities which can distinguish whether you are angry, the voice is coming from anger or it is coming from the joy. So, it is possible in, in some of this context. Another method to assess if the voice can convey discrete emotion is to have participant identify the emotion presented through vocalization and observe how much agreement there is. So, a lot of this emotion research actually does try to find out participants agreement on in case of facial expression they will show photographs of expressions in case of body movement they are shown different body movements and i ask them to identify which emotion they are conveying similarly in the voice also similar experiments were done uh, where you know certain voice clips were sh you know uh, given and uh, participant were asked to identify which emotion possibly is behind those voices so, meta analysis of 60 experiment found that means lot of so many experiments were done in the voice get understanding voice and emotion and overall analysis of all these uh, experiments is called meta analysis found that independent of the rater's culture of origin or whether the vocalizations were spontaneous or pause rater's consensus was quite high quite high in certain emotions it was very clearly people could identify which emotion the person is going through from the voice itself, particularly in the case of anger, fear, happiness, sadness and tenderness. So, these are some of the emotions where voice could very clearly indicate. So, a lot of this research indicate you know, which emotion one is experiencing. Again, Paul Ekman also because he is one of the prominent in his uh, research, he also showed in certain emotions how the voice would be typical sample of voice. So, in case of anger is vocalized could be in two ways. If it is a controlled anger, uh, one can even generate a roar and yell if not controlled. So, if it is an uncontrolled anger, so person will shout and roar and yell at around. So, one can understand when sometimes anger can be controlled it may not have that roar and yell, but it may have a sharp edge and high pitch and those kind of thing. So, in case of fear, people may uh, voice often becomes higher pitch, uh, voice often has higher pitch in case of fear and more strained one. So, you kind of speak very loudly, but very strained voice, it is not very open kind of voice. One may scream, fear may both many times we scream also. In case of sadness, uh, depending on that what type of an intensity of sadness, uh, voice can either become lower in pitch, sometimes mostly in the sadness our voice become very low in pitch, very slowly uh, we with low sound, low intensity we speak, we speak and softer volume. Sometimes higher in pitch can also be there and louder in volume depending on intensity of the sadness and situation. So, these are some of the examples I took from the Paul Ekman's website. So, voice qualities can have also have an impact on social relationships. So, how do you speak uh, can have an impact particularly in the cases of depression patients. Uh, in lot of uh, in, in some of the studies of undergraduate uh, you know uh, indicates that undergraduate judge depressed or non depressed classmate based on how they speak spoke. So, generally the participants who are depressed were more likely to be rejected in part because they sp spoke in soft flat tones and long pose. When a person becomes sad and depressed, they generally 
speak in certain uh, voices, very soft flat tones with long pauses which may lead to social rejection in many cases particularly in the schools and colleges. So, this can be a problematic part in the case of depression because they themselves are going through certain mental states which is negative and further their voice quality could kind of alienate other people. So, this alienation can further enhance the depression. So, it can become a vicious circle in that sense. So, uh, because with the emotional changes in the depression sadness becomes very strong. It kind of impacts your voice quality also and communication with the other people. So, in the, uh, the last part of this lecture, we will talk basically talking about measurement of emotions. Now, how? So, this is what we talked about communication of emotions. So, all these channels, non-verbal channels can display communicate emotion in diverse ways through facial expression, body movement and voice quality. So, these are all very significant aspects of it. So, emotions, communications, all these channels can play a very important role. Now, let us come to the measurement of emotions. So, emotions in the research, how people measure emotions. Now, we all this research we have discussed, they are saying, you know, how they are detecting emotions. How these emotions are measured in the research? So, these are some of the, uh, some of the ways in which emotions are uh, kind of measured are self-report measures, physiological measures and behavioral measures. So, let us briefly see what are these measures. So, self-report measures basically is very simple. You just ask people to describe their emotions or report their emotions in a certain scale. So, self-reports are description of the participants. So, the, because you no one else can know what is going on in a person's mind. So, you just ask them, you rate your emotions of certain emotions on a certain scale, on a 10 point scale or 5 point scale or a 7 point scale, because there is no other way to know. I Other person cannot know what kind of emotion the person is going on, what intensity of emotion one is going through. So, you ask the person, so that is called self-report description of the participants emotional feeling reported by the participant themselves. So, participant may also self-report their cognitions, behaviors associated with the emotion depending on the research purpose. So, generally they are asked to um, report their emotions on a rating scale from 1 to 10 to 1 to 7, 1 to 5 etcetera depending on the different research. For example, PANAS is one of the most popular uh, self-report measures which measures both positive and negative emotional state that people go through uh, recently in their life uh, which has uh, 20 items, 10 positive and 10 negative items. So, this scale looks something like this. So, they will ask in the last week how what kind of, uh, to what extent you have experienced all these emotions, you know from very slightly or not at all to a little to moderately quite a bit to extremely. So, this is how one can have a profile of the emotion recent emotional experiences one has gone through. So, all these emo important emotions 10 are positive 10 are negative. So, one can rate it and accordingly we can have a score of emotions. However, the self report measures have certain limitations um, just like any other thing there is no perfect kind of measures. So, they are not precise as standard of rating differs from person to person. So, when you ask person to rate it from 1 to 10 scale, now what is 5, what does 5 means even though if you specifically say or what does 10 means may differ from person to person. For one person 10 may mean something and for other person 10 may mean something else. So, but obviously there is a range to it, but idea is it may differ from person to person in terms of understanding of what this 1 to 3 means. So, one may not report one's true feeling that is also another issue. Uh, you cannot be 100 percent sure that person is reporting with uh, true authentic feelings, but as a researcher you have to kind of believe or at least trust your participant or people take sample from large sample so that you know these things should are taken care. It may be difficult to use with subjects who cannot speak or report such you cannot use self report for everybody like uh, you know if you want to take data from infants or brain damage patients or non-human subjects or people who cannot speak or something like that. So, they are because they cannot report. Using self-report measures is in different linguistic and cultural context may be difficult as it may not be easy to translate. So, if a questionnaire is in English and I want to use it in Hindi language people, uh, it may not be easy to ac accurately translate those uh, items into another language 
although people do it using lot of careful you know, measures, uh, but it may linguistic equivalence become a problem because many times languages are so different that ex exact translation may become very difficult. Despite all these limitations, self-report measures are very useful and easy to collect and provide significant information. Despite all this limitation, you have to use with certain caution, there is no other way. In many cases, you cannot use anything else but self-report measure. So, if a person has scored 5 today in a measure of emotion and 2 after a week, we can say something that the person's emotional experience is changing. If he give a score of 5 today and after 1 week, he gives us 2 in the same item, I can say this emotion is changing in that person. At least it is giving me some information. Furthermore, in many contexts, self-report is the only way to measure. There is no other way. For example, feeling aspect of emotion can only be measured by self-report what kind of feelings are going through, how can you know other than asking that person. Physiological measures are uh, another important measures that are taken by a lot of people because every emotion is associated with physiological aspect. We have discussed in detail in every theory talks about physiological arousal. So, people try to measure emotion using physiological parameters. So, most of these emotional state are associated with physiological changes in the body such as heart beating faster, sweating in the palm etcetera. Physiological measures attempts to assess some of this changes that happens as a result of emotions. Details of physiological changes associated with emotions, uh, what changes happens in detail we will discuss later in some other um, upcoming lectures. Researchers also study brain activity as a measure of emotion. So, physiological measures also include brain activity changes that happens of when we experience certain emotions. So, some of the things that are used like one is called electroencephalography EEG to measure uh, you know, physiological parameters. EEG is one approach in which electrodes are attached to the participant's scalp. So, brain either in the head so many electrodes are kind of attached to assess momentary changes in the emotional activity in the brain. So, whenever there is an emotional experiences happen, electric currents changes and those are detected by those electrodes that are put in the head and scalp. EEG measures the activity of cells in the brain area closest to each electrode millisecond by millisecond. So, it records all these changes and in a way you can say when person experience those emotions what kind of changes happens electrically. EEG is extremely beneficial when researchers need to know the exact timing of an experience. Uh, the electric response of the brain to a pleasant or unpleasant stimuli can measure in a fraction of a second. So, with quite accuracy one can see the electrical changes in the brain using this uh, methodology. Another which is very important is fun uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI which is also uh, very uh, you know, popularly used to measure you know physiological parameters particularly the brain activity. Uh, it analyzes brain activity used based on changes in the oxygen uptake in the brain. Oxygen use differences are detected by fMRI. When a brain area becomes very active because different functions are by different parts of the brain, when one part of the brain becomes very active it requires more oxygen. So, more activity means it will require more oxygen to do those activities and the hemoglobin molecule in the adjacent blood vessel releases this oxygen. So, adjacent areas releases more oxygen from the hemoglobin. fMRI actually scanner enclosing the head identifies these differences, whose that differences in the uh, hemoglobin molecule with oxygen respond differently to magnetic field than hemoglobin molecules without oxygen. So, that these differences are detected by fMRI machine and uh, this is how different parts of the brain activities are noted. An fMRI image detects changes in the brain activity within about a second of them occurring, within a second whatever changes happens it can detect, not of the millisecond or like EEG but sufficient for understanding most of the major emotions. It also pinpoints the location of these changes to within 2 to 3 mm k aspers. It can give an accuracy of location where it these changes are happening, even deep within the brain providing significantly higher spatial accuracy than EEG. So, it can give spatial accuracy which zo area is responsible for certain activity, fMRI is much better in terms of giving location. So, this there are certain advantages of physiological measures uh, that it is, it is much more precise as compared to self report measure. Self report you are just reporting we may not know exactly how it is, but in case of physiological measure it is much more precise. 
For example, we are not sure what it means to claim nervousness fell from 5 to 2 in a self-report measure, except that we know it, it has lowered. But in physiological measure, if you know heart rate jump from 75 to 110 beats per minute, we know specifically measurably we know how much heart rate has increased. Furthermore, the definition of heart rate is unambiguous. No one can say what heart rate means changes. No, Self-report may it can change. What is happiness may differ from person to person. One can have different arguments, uh, but heart what is heart rate is not changing from person to person. Whereas, we never know whether someone else definition of nervousness is same as to ours. So, for self-report may subjective differences can happen. However, just like other measures, physiological measures also have some limitation. Uh, physiological markers of emotion can vary also from person to person, uh, even though they are very accurate in uh, most of the context. Some of this variety is due to the fact that people who are engaged in various activities, but even within the same activity, people's bodies differ. No? Everybody's brain activity will be different. So, those in the in the beginning people may differ in certain activities. So, that can also create problem. For these reasons, researchers typically examine the impact of emotion by taking first a baseline measure and then they will take after certain intervention response or certain emotional experience how it changes. So, then they compare with the baseline and after effect. Measures like EEG and fMRI have significant practical problems. One thing is these are very costly, not possible for every researcher to use them. In case of FM, fMRI, one has to go lie inside a machine which can be very difficult and problematic for a lot of people and the machine will surround your head and can be very noisy. Many people particularly children and suffering from other uh, diseases or mental issues like claustrophobia may be unable to go through this kind of machines. So, practical issues are usme. expensive, one is expensive, second is everybody cannot go through all these things, we cannot collect data from large number of people also. Furthermore, fMRI technology is very expensive and few researchers outside hospitals or major research institutions have access to it. Uh, the process limits the kind of experience that can be tested by the investigator. Majority of our ordinary experiences occur, so it, because it becomes very limited in a particular setting in a machine, inside a machine you are measuring something, so it's, it, it becomes very limited. In real life, how emotion is experienced, it is difficult to actually use those machine in uh, more real life situation. So, the brain scan study results must be interpreted, then interpretation of the result becomes very difficult. One has to be very technically knowledgeable to understand, otherwise you know the, the interpretation can also create problem. One man, one can make an erroneous you know, interpretation of what is the finding of these machines and so on. A lot of technical knowledge is required. The last one is the behavioral observation means we also can re, uh, report or kind of measure emotion by observing the behavior how people behave in the real life. Now, observational data can give us information about emotional state of an individual. For example, we assume that individuals are afraid when they jump, scream uh, at the sight of a snake or something like that. We infer anger when someone make fist and shout. So, these are observations we make apparently of their behavior and then say certain emotions they are going through. So, our parents also taught us uh, the terms of emotion by inferring our emotions from the action and then telling you are fearful. So, this is how we learn actually people observe our behavior and then say are you experiencing fear. So, like this observational data are very prominent in our day to day life also. As people frequently cannot or do not choose to accurately report of their own emotion, researchers generally separate self report of observational. So, generally people use observational data also along with self report measure. So, that enhances the validity of the findings. So, I may not just completely rely on what person is saying, but I am also observing how this person is behaving in a certain context of the research. So, that will validate my finding. More specifically, analysis of facial expression can provide information about emotional state, observation of facial expression. When people feel angry, for example, they frequently lower their eyebrows, crunch, uh, crunch them together and etcetera. So, all this facial expression also can give additional information. Particularly, uh, Paul Ekman has developed something called as facial action coding system, FAX, we call it as a FAX, is a behavioral coding system used to by researchers to record facial muscles contract. So, it can very detailed way we can analyze the muscles contractions in the face and analyze which emotion one is going through. So, this kind of softwares also can be used to 
for detailed behavioral observation. Certain muscular contraction patterns are more likely to occur when people experience certain emotions uh, or are in a certain circumstances likely to provoke a specific emotions. Now, this uh, kind of uh, coded facial expression can also have many limitations. People can try with very degree of success to sometimes people can fake expression also now that is also can become problem. Uh, coding facial expression takes very long time again it is a very technical thing one has to know how to code and how to analyze everybody cannot do that. Uh, muscle movement can be very subtle and it takes a lot of practice and time to correctly understand what is happening. While most scholars agree on the meaning of some expression many differ or unsure about it. So, nonetheless given enough time and effort researcher can classify a wide range of facial expression with enough high rates of agreement. So, usme, uh, certain issues are there in terms of technical understanding and theoretical knowledge. So, what is the best measure of emotions? All these are kind of important and should be used whenever depending on the context whatever is feasible. And it is better to use multiple sources of data from multiple measure measures that enhances the validity as much as possible. Thank you. With this we will end uh, today's lecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm.